Hey everybody, it's Gomladex, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today we have the return of Arena Cube Drafts. For those who don't know, a Cube Draft is a format where instead of drafting from a specific set, or a specific booster of cards all from one set, we're going to be drafting from a curated list of the strongest cards on the entirety of Arena. As you can see, there's tons of constructed staples in the card pool, tons of rares, mythics, powerhouse cards from formats like standard all the way back to historic and explorer so this is going to be a draft format where our decks are going to be much closer to the kind of constructed power level that you would see in standard and explorer and stuff like that rather than the lower power level you generally get out of a draft format so because of that because we're ending up with so many rares and mythics in our deck this is a phantom draft format so we don't keep any of the cards that we draft today we're just competing for the prizes on the event tracker, as well as just having some fun playing around with these cards. If you're interested in playing the Arena Cube in a more competitive environment, there will be an Arena Open for this event this weekend. I will not be attending this weekend's Arena Open due to prior engagements, but I hope that any of you that will be have the best of luck and have a great time in the events. But I'm gonna be over here competing for my potential 6,000 gold and three cards, and uh, just doing what I can in the regular draft queues. So with that whole intro out of the way, without further ado, let's hop into the draft and see where the cards take us today. And here we are for our pack one pick one where you can see there are a ton of incredibly powerful options and really a bunch of different ways that you could take this draft right now. So one of the most important things that I think in the early picks in Arena Cube Draft is to prioritize the cards that fit into the decks and the play styles that you're more comfortable with, that you think you're going to be better with, because in Arena Cube, you have a lot of room to miss out on taking the strongest, strongest card in each pack, because there's just so many incredibly, incredibly powerful options, and you can really steer the ship in the kind of directions that you want to go, because again, there are very, very few duds in this format, so just taking the best 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 card is not super super important rather than taking cards that are going to work together well or cards that you're going to be able to play with well so when i get a pack like this and i see really strong aggro options i'm generally going to take them so if you want to see a lot of mono red aggro drafts a lot of aggressive drafts in general this is probably the channel to stick around to that is my comfort food that is what i'm going to do when i'm not going to be playing any competitive arena cube drafts this season anyway i'm probably just going to take the great aggro cards like town razor tyrant a big flyer that burns an opponent's land away or a rekindling phoenix that keeps coming back or a pillar of flame that can exile something i actually might go pillar of flame since it's the most flexible of those cards but there are other incredibly powerful cards in that pack of course meat hook massacre is the huge board wipe some other stuff like that but since i'm not trying to get into the arena open or anything this time around i'm probably just going to draft what i want to draft rather than what might be um a nice variety of decks to get practice with everything here so i'm probably going to be pretty dang aggressive and we'll start with pillar of flame but because i took pillar of flame i am flexible towards going towards haughty Jin instead of just immediate mono red aggro stuff or third path iconoclast and that is the value of pillar of flame over those other cards any deck that has any amount of red can use this as cheap removal and it's particularly good in the decks that care about a lot of instants and sorceries so we could head towards the blue red spells direction i could stick to mono red for now we don't have to like we don't have to commit to a second color yet and i mean in cube we don't have to commit to a second color at all there's just so many powerful red cards so we could take like electrostatic blast here which is another cheap burn spell that's also card draw which is pretty nice also seasoned pyromancer which is great in reanimator chandra's solid and like racto sack i'll just go for the blast we'll stick to red for now if we become full mono red great I love just forcing mono red at least once per arena cube draft cycle, and if we do it in the first draft, that would be the most gauntlet thing that I could do. So, uh, yeah, if we could make it full mono red, sure, we'll do it, but if not, we'll have a really solid start with just a bunch of great burn spells that fit well into any deck. So we'll take Collective Defiance now. Very flexible card, particularly good in mono red because you do need two red mana to cast this. But being able to shoot a creature for four and shoot your opponent in the face or do both of those and discard your hand draw a new uh, new hand is pretty awesome so big fan of collective defiance lightning strike is great as well zealous conscripts a pretty great finisher 
We'll go for Collective Defiance. Pack one, pick four. There's still a Torolf's Disciple here. We will have to choose a second color when this pack comes back around. Or we just take like an Inspiring Vantage just in case or something. But big fan of the Disciple. Three mana, three, three haste. And it just shuffles a playset of Lightning Bolt into your deck every time it attacks. And Lightning Bolt is not a bad draw at any point of the game for almost any deck in cube. But especially for aggressive decks like Mono Red. So that is just a pretty big upside to just have a bunch of Lightning Bolts in your deck now. Legion War Boss is a fantastic card. Three mana for a 2-2 two -two that spits out a 1-1 one -one attacking every turn. Awesome stuff there. There's also Magda, which is pretty nice, but not like the most necessary card for Mono Red. This one, a little more fun in like Red Green Stompy and stuff, where you can use this to help get like a 5 or 6 drop threat down early. Mono Red, it'll just let you dump your hand a little quicker, but you're usually pretty good at doing that already. Pack 1, pick 6. Plarg is just a 2 mana 2-2 two, two looter that can discard a card, draw a card. I guess if we get to 5 mana, we get to dig 5 cards deep and cast something for free. That's interesting. I don't know why Plarg and Augusta are in the cube. I guess they just needed a certain number of cards in every color pair. I'm not going to play Gigantha because I have that Collective Defiance, and if I find Embercleave and stuff, I'd want to be able to play those as well. So I don't think we're going to have a Dragonth in the companion slot. I don't love Faithless looting in Mono Red. You really want this in decks that care about the number of instant sorceries in their graveyard or have like good graveyard abilities like Unearth or Flashback. Otherwise, you're just down a card when you do it. Guess I just take Plarg. But Plarg doesn't seem fantastic. Beaumont Courier is fantastic. This is a really easy card to miss as well. One mana, one, one haste. So just chips in. It exiles the top card of your library every time it does. And whenever it gets walled off, whenever it can't attack anymore, you can still attack with it one last time, get one more card tucked away under it, and then discard your hand to draw everything that you exile to the Beaumont Courier. So great way to refuel after you've dumped your hand, and that is something that Mono Red is very good at doing. Or, again, any aggressive red strategy. There's a Krenko and a Perforos' Intervention in here. So more fantastic options. Uh, intervention clears a path pretty easily. Two mana for two damage, three mana for four damage. Yeah, that's always going to be pretty efficient. Franco just keeps getting a wider and wider board state. I already have two three mana creatures, but it's a pretty big one. Just spits a bunch of stuff out. Got three burn spells, two three mana creatures, a two mana creature, and a one mana creature. Uh, I'll go for Krenko here. Well, I do like the flexibility on intervention, but Krenko's just big. We get Town Razor Tyrant back, which is fantastic. Somebody did take the Rekindling Phoenix, so we are not the only red drafter at the table. It's not going to be a completely free mono red draft pod, but we're in an incredible position to be in any aggressive red deck. So we're happy to take the Town Razor Tyrant. Yeah, things are looking very swell right now. We even get the Seasoned Pyromancer back, but we also see Haughty Jin and Third Path Iconoclast. So that's a pretty good sign that our second color can easily be blue here. I think I'd rather take the Iconoclast. Double blue is a bit much when we're this deep into red. I'd like to have blue be a bit of a splash where we don't need to hit double blue. But Haughty Jin is a bit stronger than Iconoclast, but this card is still very nice. I'm going to take the Iconoclast here. I could definitely see the argument for the Haughty Jin. But the Iconoclast, just a bit easier to get down on the board more consistently. It also fits into our curve a little bit wetter. A little bit wetter. A little bit better. This heat wave that we've had lately, I guess, is just uh, melting my brain, my ability to talk. But that's kind of a constant in these videos. Act 1, pick 12 now. Not much. I'll take Inspiring Vantage in case we find some good Boros aggro stuff. Magda, pick 13. Like the last solid card in red in that pack. So red is definitely not very contested. There's like one other red drafter, maybe two. The amount of red cards that we've seen flying around and coming back, 
I think it'd be pretty reasonable to assume that there might just be one other red drafter that took like the um, Rekindling Phoenix and whatever other red cards that didn't wheel. Only a few of them that didn't come back. We got that Lightning Strike super late, and that is a flexible one that's fantastic for every red deck, so we're really happy to see that. Storm Tamer is definitely not unplayable for an aggressive, tempo-oriented deck, so we'll keep it in the main deck for now. Alright, we opened up kind of a dud. I don't think Elder Dragon War is particularly powerful in mono red or just red aggro in general. Even if we are going to be blue red here, we're going to be blue red aggro rather than like blue red control, where I think Elder Dragon War is still not the greatest. I mean, it's a four mana, four, four flyer. We still probably just take it here, but I don't know. Maze Mind Tome is weird. I don't think that's what you want to be doing in mono red. It's nice to have card advantage in a color that doesn't usually get it, but you want to be spending all of your mana in the early game, setting up creatures, getting extra damage in, clearing the board, things that affect the board and damage your opponent. You're trying to end the game super quickly. You can't afford to spend an extra two mana every single turn to draw another card until very late in the game with a mono red deck, so... It's it's like good hypothetically because red doesn't have good card draw, but bad because you don't want to be spending your mana on card draw until much later. So I'll still take the Elder Dragon War there. Uh, Hellrider is pretty awesome. By itself, it's basically a four mana, four, three haste. I guess it doesn't kill four toughness creatures, but it does do four damage to your opponent by attacking with itself. And with any other creatures, you're dealing a bunch of additional damage. I like Hellrider. It's a fun just... Lightning Ball. Ooh, Shivan Devastator is super flexible. Anywhere on the curve, you slam that down and get a bunch of damage in, but probably be taking the excellent cheap burn first. We've only got four non-creatures right now, tons of creatures. So Molten Impact is a fantastic one. Generally, if you're trying to choose between burn spells and one of them is an alchemy burn spell, the alchemy burn spells are just broken. So you should probably take one of those. They don't shoot face, which is a downside. But with Molten Impact, if you shoot a small creature, then your next burn spell gets to shoot two things. Because it's going to do the damage equal to the excess damage to something else. While doing whatever the spell would normally do. Um, Strangle's really efficient, so that I guess is still on the, uh, the scale here. But I think Impact is better than Devil's Play for just pure efficiency being so good. We'll take the Molten Impact. Ooh. I mean, I can play this in Mono Red. This is just a free companion, no matter what. If we ever run out of cards, we just drag that in another sideboard. I think I have to take Lutri here, but I'd like to take Grim Lava Mancer as well. This is a really strong card for red strategies, particularly ones that have a lot of instants and sorceries. The more consistently you're filling your graveyard, the better it gets very obviously, and one easy way to do that in red is to cast a bunch of instants and sorceries, like a bunch of burn spells, so it's better in the more spell-oriented red decks, like blue-red, than it is in the more creature-oriented red decks, like red-white, so do keep that in mind, but it is very powerful, so that's certainly a huge option, but I still really like taking companions when I don't have to do like any deck-building restrictions to meet them. When it's just automatically, okay, I'm going to start every game with an 8-card hand. It's just the 8th card in my hand is a 6-mana 3-2, which isn't that great, but still. Better than starting with a 7-card hand. Just got to spend 3-mana to put a 3-2 in my hand, and then 3-mana to play it again later. Pack 2, pick 6, probably so Ken's in here, but cut is an option. You don't have to have access to ribbons for this to be playable. 2-mana for 4 damage to a creature can clear out... A lot of stuff, but we just have better versions like Molten Impact that does the same thing and then also clears out another creature later. Could take Commit to Memory, which is a fine tempo play. I think it's super, super great for blue-red, and I'm really, really close to just being full mono-red. There's an Obliterating Bolt, which is also just a better version of Cut for us, so I'll take that. Could also take Ottawara or Champion of Wits. Pretty cool. Okay, Volcanic Spite, 3 to anything but a player, and then you can ditch a card, draw a card. 
or a braid that has the flexibility of blowing up artifacts. Also, Siege Gang Commander is a finisher. Actually, kind of like grabbing the finisher here. We'll scoop up a Siege Gang. I'm doing pretty great at getting a lot of burn because nobody's really been taking it in this draft pod. All right, we grab the Maze Mind Tome here. Actually, probably Impulse. We've got a lot of instant speed burn, and we can use Impulse at instant speed instead now if we are blue-red. Uh, I'm not getting any red cards back here, but as far as I remember, I don't think there were any great red cards here anyway. Chart, of course, could be good in blue-red. Attack in, and then we just draw two off of it for two mana, which is very, very good. Still going to take Devil's Play over the Spire Bluff Canal, though. Definitely Grim Lava Mancer. And I'll just cast Ulamog in Mono Red. It'll be very easy. That's definitely going to be in the main deck. No, we'll, we'll ditch Ulamog here. All right, well, we kind of did it. I have 20... I have 19 Mono Red cards right now. So our final pack, we can just entirely take cards that improve the deck rather than having to hit a certain quantity of cards. We get to really just focus on what do I want to cut out of this deck to improve it and taking cards to replace those could be pretty great. We'll definitely take Fable of the Mirror Breaker here. One of the best red cards of all time, as you can see by the fact that it's banned in a ton of formats, uh, but it is pretty busted. You get a 2-2 that gives you a treasure token every time it attacks. Then you can discard up to two cards and draw that many cards. Then you get a 2-2 that can make duplicates of your creatures to beat down with. Fable of the Mirror Breaker is a fantastic card. Uh, I think Kenra Spell Spear is actually a little better than Young Pyro in here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 instant sorceries. Yeah, we're getting a little more creature focused, a little less spell focused, cutting out the blue with the third path and stuff like that. So I think I'll take the spell spear here. It's two mana, two, two trample. If we're ever out of cards, we just buff it into a three, three trample. The prowess can get some extra damage in as well. I mean, they're both good and we probably get both, but I actually think I want spell spear a little more. Now we have Bloodthirsty Adversary, which I really, really like. 2 mana, 2-2 two, two haste to get down on the curve, but if we top deck it late in the game when we have 5 mana up, we can recast a burn spell from Grave by kicking it. Really great card. The next best card is Mishra's Command here. Dragon Master Outcast is a powerful card, but you probably shouldn't be playing it in mono red because it's basically a 6 drop. Like, it's not going to do anything until you have 6 or more lands. And generally in these mono red aggro decks, by the time you have six lands, you want your opponents already just be dead most of the time. Or at the very least, you just don't want a lot of high mana value spells like that. So Outcast is really cool and really powerful, but it's really good in like red green. Not so much mono red. All right, Terror of the Peaks is a fine finisher and we are low enough on high cards, high mana value cards. We can definitely take it and run it. Vindictive Flamestoker. Discard your hand, draw four. I mean, it's a one mana one, two until you do that. That does absolutely nothing else. It is the only red card, so we still take it, but might get cut. I guess it's also a one drop creature on curve, which is good. Yeah, this is a 24 card deck, 16 lands. It's probably where we want to be. So it stays for now, but we do get to make some considerations when we start drafting more cards from now on. We get to start cutting a card every time. Rabbit Battery. I don't care very much about that. I guess it's pretty good with like Krenko if we get that turn four. But having to spend the extra mana to reconfigure onto things, it doesn't actually play that incredibly well. Ooh, Searing Blood does. Well, actually, Searing Blood has a pretty big downside where you have to kill the creature that you're shooting with it to damage the player. But if you do, it's really good. Two to a creature and three to the face. I still take it there over the big, like, board wipe kind of thing. Not really something Mono Red needs. I'm just going to hate draft to fairy. I know what must be done. Less to fairies in the world. We have improved the world slightly. All right, pack three, pick nine. Again, nothing we can really do here. I'm just going to hose the blue-white player. We 
got the young pirate. I'll definitely play the Spell Spear and the Pyromancer. I will not play the Dragon Master. I'm going to run a pretty low land count here. Maybe 14? I think I want to go below like 14 lands. But we only need to cut like one or two cards. All right, grab our last few baubles and bits here. Then pick a couple cards to cut out of here and get into the gameplay, see what people are coming up with. It's one of my favorite things. Oh my god, last pick burn down the house. We might play it. Probably not. It is a five drop. Okay, arena. I definitely didn't know what Vault Progress was. Anyways, it is a 5-drop in our Mono Red deck, and it's like a board wipe that's two-sided, which we really don't want most of the time, but as like a, a backup plan if things go wrong, it might be fine, because worst case scenario, it's always going to spit out those Devils with haste, which is nice. It's not great for the 5 mana, though. All right, cool. Deck Builder still lags out, so we cannot sort like that. We'll have to make our own little piles here. All right, so I've sorted out the non-land cards between creatures and non-creatures here, and I think first and foremost, we are a mono red deck. We're never going to be stuck off a of second color. We cut at least two lands here, drop down to the 15 pretty easily. Uh, but then we just want to go through and probably cut out some of the weakest cards everywhere on the curve, as well as maybe some of the weakest spells. So first off, I think Flame Stoker probably generally just takes much, much too much time to draw us the extra cards while sitting there doing nothing as a one mana one two. So I want to drop that. Beaumont Courier just seems far superior. Like the Lava Mancer a lot. Battery's fine, but it's on the chopping block. Adversary's fantastic. Spell Spear's fine, but on the chopping block. Magda, that extra ramp could be pretty solid, dumps our hand a little more quickly, which could be pretty aggro. Plarg, definitely flexible, but not super powerful. That's on the chopping block. Pyro, we did end up with 10 instant sorceries, probably right on that borderline, that's pretty fine. Fable's incredible, Krenko's very explosive, war bosses, incredible. Disciple's solid, Hellrider solid. Elder Dragon War versus Town Razor Tyrant. I think Elder Dragon War a little less interesting to us. And then Siege Gang and Terror of the Peaks. Both solid finishers. Probably just cut two of these two cards here. And, uh, and call it a deck from there. So let's throw in... Let's go like Rabbit Battery Plarg, I think. Because Plarg gives us... Some opportunities to dig for lands. If we aren't hitting them at the right time, we can discard our big five mana spells to draw a card, try to hit land. And then if we're flooding out, we can also use Plarg to dig for some burn spells and shoot them out. Yeah, I think I like Plarg for that flexibility. We cut the Elder Dragon War and the Spell Spear. Call it a deck there. Probably are some other adjustments we can make that would be a little better. Maybe cut a burden on the house, put the spell spear back in or something, but seems like a super reasonable place for the deck to be, so call it a deck there. All right, so here's a look at our completed deck list for today, which is going to be a mono red aggro deck. My favorite kind of deck to play in any constructed format whenever I do that, and my favorite deck to draft in the arena cubes. I always got to do these at least once per arena cube draft cycle so we'll get it out of my system right out of the way here so we've got a lot of great aggressive hasting cards like beaumont courier Torolf's disciple a lot of stuff that's just really good at finding ways to push damage in like hellrider getting extra damage in krenko and legion war boss spitting out a bunch of little one ones to help attack with same with young pyromancer a lot of really aggressive creatures that just find ways to push a bunch of damage through and then a stack of burn spells and the thing that's really nice 
about mono red aggro decks and burn decks and stuff like that is that burn spells are always super flexible at least the majority of the time a lot of them do two damage to any target so you can use your spells like pillar of flame devil's play flames of the firebrand you can use these to clear a path to help your creatures get extra damage in by shooting away your opponent's creatures or if you've gotten your opponent pretty low on their life total you can start shooting them in the face with these burn spells and finding those last few points of damage so really solid mono red aggro deck here today pretty excited to see how it does as we head into the gameplay here we are on the play for game one we've got rabbit battery into plarg to start things off lightning strike to deal with an opposing threat Turn three, I could just put Lutri into my hand if I have nothing else to do. Opponent goes turn one, den of the bugbear. Pretty suspicious, I think. It's gonna be the mono red mirror immediately. Red white, so still a very aggressive archetype. Boros aggro, very creature heavy aggro deck. But they can certainly have their fair share of burn spells out of the red. Mephit's Enthusiasm, another one of those alchemy burn spells. That one deals four to a creature, and then the next creature that they play comes with a bunch of extra power. So because they did three excess damage, their next creature is going to hit the board with three extra power. But then we can just lightning strike it anyway. It doesn't get any extra toughness or anything. Kenra Spell Spear. All right. Does not have ward until they flip it, so we can lightning strike that nice and easy. And then we can go tear the peaks into Siege Gang, which is pretty cool. We can also just trade Plarg into it. They are not going to block, so we will not be trading Plarg into it. Let's lightning strike. Get that out of here and pass the turn. They do have a Rogren Triumph, so they could be playing blue cards as well. They could be blue, red, white. But because the Triomes are at least dual lands that cycle, sometimes people will play them even in just their two color decks. There's a Blade Splicer, which is a pretty annoying roadblock, so we're pretty happy to have some flyers to start jamming in with now. Thanks to Terror of the Peaks. Pass the turn here. Actually, I think I want to discard Young Pyromancer to draw a card with Plarg here. We don't have any other instants and sorceries in our hand, and when we draw one, we're only going to get one, one, one out of it, and they're doing a decent job cluttering up the ground right now, and probably will have plenty of other creatures to cast on the ground. So I could see Plarg discard Young Pyro draw a card as a decent play here, but I could also just wait on it and just have that available if I need to... Um, if I need to ditch extra lands later... Love trading Plarg into Blade Splicer. It might be where we're at. Probably not with a Siege Gang Commander coming up. Take 8 damage here, go to 12. Life totals are evened. Cards in hand are even, but I draw a card first. I'm slightly... No, we're pretty much tied. I think I'm just going to tap out for Siege Gang next turn, so I don't need to discard Pyro yet. So whatever I draw is probably not getting played. Town Razor Tyrant. Okay, maybe it is getting played. Because now I can Town Razor Tyrant their Den of the Bugbear. Means I could plarg away Lutri looking for land 6 to play Pyro and Tyrant. Lutri not good till I draw an instant or sorcery, but going to be very good when I do. Is it worth the discard? Probably not. Let's just jam in. We're at 12 here. We blow up their den of the bugbear or shoot them for two. And even if they keep the den, it doesn't get to attack anymore. And den of the bugbear was the big reason I was saying we were pretty much tied in terms of life total cards in hand, board state, all that stuff. Elite Spellbinder, that's pretty annoying. Yeah, any non-land card, so just makes Siege Gang uncastable.
All right, so they sack the den. We draw into a Krenko. Hit like any instant or sorcery, we can probably just burn them completely out of the game. We're not hitting them right now. If I attack him, they trade both flyers into Town Razor Tyrant. That is not good. Could start digging with Plarg if I don't dump my whole hand. This would have been such a good turn for Siege Gang. That Elite Spellbinder is pretty rough. Been a great turn to just Siege Gang, and then Plarg can discard one of these two. I feel like Krenko's actually the worst card here. And this way I've got the three mana if I need to just flash in a 3-2 blocker. Uh, but we do discard Krenko to draw a card. Shout out on the Scalds. All right, we got to find something fast now because that's a draw four. And next turn, every time they cast a spell, they put a counter on something. Of course, they get the Clarion Spirit trigger here, which is bad. There's a Devil's Play. It's a burn spell. It's not a big enough one to kill them with loot tree. But it is a burn spell. Could Devil's Play the Spellbinder and then I can attack with Town Razor Tyrant? And I can cast Toralth's Disciple on blocks. But then they just trump with a 1 1 and they're fine. If Devils play their face, they're still at 5, and we need to find a Lightning Strike or something to kill them. I probably don't die next turn, though. Still on Lightning Strike style burn. As our win condition here. Discard Twarlf's Disciple, draw a card. Alright, we basically have one last draw step to find a kill. Where the shown on the Scalds plus Clarion Spirit has just popped off to our demise. They've got two flying blockers, yeah, so we're not gonna... You just sack Selfless Spirit here. So I just need to not die basically. Doesn't really matter what I do, because they just sack Selfless Spirit. So if that's the case, just stop the most damage with these trumps. Which I guess is like that. And that goes there. One, two, three, four, five. We keep Plarg, so I have more opportunities to find lethal. And we dig for a burn spell. That's what we've got. Oh, there's the play with fire for Plarg. Come on, burn spell. That's a mountain. Come on, burn spell. Flames of the Firebrand. Let's go. Three to the face. Copy it. Another three to the face, and that is game. An absolute nail-biter for game one. We just could not find the cheap burn till super late, but it arrived just in time, the moment before we got exploded by the Clarion Spirit Showdown of the Scalds combo to just have tons of spells, tons of 1-1 flyers come to the board every turn. Super wide board state, but in the end, just shooting some burn spells at your opponent's face. A solid way to end some games. We're gonna be 1-0 as we head into game two. Here we are now for game two, definite keep.
a fable the mirror breaker. No way do we mulligan that. Couple creatures to jam out. If our opponent doesn't play anything we need to kill, then we can just put a loot tree in our hand. If they do, we've got several ways to clear their board. Opponent is on blue-green so far. We're going to be absolutely loaded. We're going to be filthy rich over here. We're Scrooge McDuck just diving into the pool of treasure. Magda plus the Goblin Shaman token. There's a Rish card to blow up. We have found a target. It's a Mana Dork as well. Yeah, 3-3 three, is an annoying size blocker, plus it's a Mana Dork for our opponent. Um... This is probably greedy, but I'm going to get rid of Rabbit Battery in a Mountain to look for some stronger stuff. Well, there you go. Molten Impact is definitely better than Obliterating Bolting, I think, by a little bit. And I can Bloodthirsty Adversary with Haste for extra damage. Sure. All right, they're just going to scoop them up. They did not like their start against an aggressive red deck and probably did not like the amount of time that I took to make a decision there or something. Or something came up. You never know with this stuff, really. Arena is a multi-platform game. They could have been on the toilet and then something explosive happened. I don't know. We are 2-0 now, heading into a game number three. Here we are for game three. Very low on creatures, but... We have excellent interaction, and of course, we'll always have our elemental otter friend later in the game. The Siege Gang on 5 is a great way to top off the curve. Ooh, a white deck? Yeah, I was going to say, please be aggressive, and there we go. So they're going to give us some creatures to burn. We immediately draw Beaumont Courier, so we'll offer the trade, which probably happens. No. All right. It's probably good for us. That means they've got a nice aggressive curve they want to keep beating down with. Probably. Yep. So Searing Blood, Pillar of Flame, very active here. So we're going to Searing Blood the Soldier. Kill that and shoot them for three. And I can Pillar of Flame the Cult Conscript later if I need to. And it'll be permanently exiled so it doesn't come back. I really need to kill Adeline. That's really bad for me. Adeline, one of the strongest white cards ever printed. We do top deck Molten Impact like an absolute champion. If our opponent doesn't have removal for this Beaumont Courier then I think we've kind of got this game on lock because we can just like dump our hand out and then get a new one. Thalia, Heretic, Cathar. Well, there's our Devil's Play target now. One man away from these five drops? Sure. X equals two, so we've got the one red to sack the Beaumont Courier if they try to kill it with removal. Which I will do. I think four random cards is better than two five drops when we have four lands on board. So we're not guaranteed to just immediately draw a mountain. Lingering souls. Oh, that's actually kind of a problem. So we can't really kill all of those with one burn spell. Now I could, with Terror of the Peaks and a Siege Gang Commander, clear them all out. But that's only if our opponent doesn't have removal for Terror of the Peaks, obviously. Okay, they've got the removal for Terror of the Peaks, so that's not going to happen. They've got the two mana up to cast Lingering Souls again. That's going to be pretty bad. Cast a Priest of Forgotten Gods instead. That doesn't gain them any life, does it? No, that'll make me lose life and some other stuff. So they're at 7 with no way to gain life, and I have a Siege Gang Commander here, which is 6 damage. Plus Electrostatic for another 2. 
Devil's Play for more damage. Yeah, I'm at 12. We just drop a Siege Gang and start burning their face. Actually, this is 8 damage. I totally forgot. Siege Gang plus 3 other goblins. 8 damage all banked up. Oh, but Steel Seraph? I think that was off the top, too. That's rough. I guess they only get one point of lifelink right now, but the fact that they have lifelink available is horrendous for us if we don't top deck a land. To just Devils play the Seraph. Oh. That's very interesting. Hmm. Oh, I wish I had one more mana. I can put them to one off of the Hellrider attacks. That's still one damage off. I'm at 10 life here. If I Devil's Play... I can't Devil's Play the Seraph. I'd have to throw two goblins at it. That is really unfortunate. I could throw a blast and a goblin at it, I guess. And if I do that, they get to use priest, sack the seraph, and their one one on the ground. All right. Well, two of these are gonna die anyway. So we just sack the two that they block with their creatures that are higher than two toughness, I think. Take the trade elsewhere. Still have a Devil's Play and a Blast. Yeah, so we clear out some creatures here, I think. I probably should have attacked with Beaumont Courier as well. That was not good. All right, this way I get to hold more mana up instead of having to spend four to kill the Seraph. They're down to just Priest. Electrostatic the Priest, it can't sack itself, right? Cannot sack itself. I guess they could s use Priest in response. I have to sack my only creature left, but then they're down to just two 1-1 one -one flyers. I'm actually interested in that. Because I can respond by just sacking Beaumont Courier. Getting a fresh four instead of these two. I think it's just worse for them if they use Priest. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a good deal for them. Find a burn down the house. Very exciting. And land for turn, which is huge. Luminarch Aspirants. Counter on a flyer, hit us for three. Pass. Burn on the house, cast Plarg. Alright, they're just going to crack the clearing to draw a card. Sky Sovereign, that's an incredible draw. You could buy Plarg, and also if they draw any creatures to crew it, we die. Yep, that's a very nice draw. Um, Yeah, I can't stop that. I just slam down a bunch of sorcery speed stuff and hope they don't hit a three power creature. Alright, that's a two power creature. Makes our devils play more expensive, which is bad. I think I keep Town Razor Tyrant. It can chump block Sky Sovereign, worst case scenario, because it's got four toughness. 
Thalia, this attacks as a 2-3. Okay, this doesn't attack into Thalia, but Krenko does. I don't have the mana to Devil's Play and Town Razor Tyrant. Actually, I do, because the treasure token, I've got exactly enough. No, I don't. Cost five total. Yeah. All right. I'd have three mana up after. Okay, I think it's better than to just... Krenko and Town Razor Tyrant. So they hit a creature where they cruise Sky Sovereign. I'm blocking with Town Razor Tyrant here. Plus I get to blow up on their lands. All right. Incredibly close game there. A big back and forth. Some real solid draws from us. Some real solid draws from our opponent. But in the end, we get a little bit ahead off of our Beaumont Courier. And they just did not find the creature to immediately crew the Sky Sovereign for the insta-lethal. So we are 3-0, and oh, heading into game number 4. Here we are for game 4. Really hoping to hit some lands here, or that our opponent's playing a bunch of cheap creatures, and there they go. They did start off with an Avacyn's Pilgrim. We can burn that away, but yeah, this is the unfortunate part. We don't have one mana removal, so it is going to be a mana dork for a turn. Play one of those cards. Yeah, we're going to use the Electrostatic Blast to find our next land. So now they play something, I bolt it or lightning strike it and then grab a land off of elect Electrostatic Thingamabob. Molten Impact, Lightning Strike, Obliterating Bolt. I think I'd like to get the Sorcery Speed removal out of the way. Don't know if they're going to play a cheap enough card. I guess because I have Flames coming up, I should Molten Impact. Because with Flames, I can pretty easily find a way to stack up the excess 1 damage into maybe killing something. Alright, play the Mountain. Ovenwald Oddities. So, yep. Now we deal 4 damage to that. Off of a three damage burn spell. I think I want to use flames instead of lightning strike since I can't double spell this turn regardless. So we'll get the more expensive spell out of the way. Another land. And now we just start throwing a bunch of lightning bolts in our deck. Sure. Could do Hell, Re Hell Rider. It's a little bit more immediate damage, but I'm a sucker for lightning bolts. I'm just going to start shuffling them in. Hell Rider is also more mana efficient. Hell Rider is almost objectively the better play, but I love putting some lightning bolts in my deck, and there we go. Now we Hell Rider. Get this killed by their next removal spell. Maybe not. Town Razor Tyrant is just a 4 4 flyer here, but still good. Against the empty board. Oh, they are really flooding out. And that's just another mana dork. Yep. Another mana ramp card. Get a Collective Defiance, and that's just game if they've got nothing in hand. Because we can escalate it, shoot their creature in their face. That's lethal. Yeah. Alright. Opponent just flooded out big time. They got the ramp going for them, but they just did not hit anything they were trying to ramp into, so... Unfortunate game for our opponent there, but solid stuff for us. We didn't have to get crushed by an Ulamog or an Emrakul or whatever they were trying to do at the top end of that curve there. Some kind of flying spaghetti monster. We're going to be 4-0 now as we head into game number 5. And here we are for game 5 with a beautiful start. We've got our little Beaumont Courier to start 
getting a second hand underneath that. We've got the Torolf's Disciple turn three to just load our deck with Lightning Bolts. We are against another red deck, though. They've got a Lutri in their sideboard as well. We'll have to see if they're mono red. Any red deck in the format can use Lutri, though. Because, again, because of that companion restriction just being that every card in your deck has a different name, that's always going to happen in cube. So it's just a free companion if you're playing red at all. You don't have to be blue-red. You don't have to be mono-red. But... In this case scenario, it does look like our opponent is mono red, and we're going to need to blow up that robber of the rich immediately, otherwise they're going to keep using our own burn spells against us, and that'll play very poorly for us. So we're going to immediately obliterating bolt that. Because they already hit a pillar of flame, so if they attacked with it next turn, they could attack and then pillar of flame our Beaumont courier without it even costing them a card, because they just cast our Pillar of Flame. Ooh, Fanatical Firebrand, goodbye, Beaumont Courier. It was nice knowing ya. There's a Rada's Firebrand for our opponent as well. We can Searing Blood that and get a Rabbit Battery down. I don't want to attack into that with a Disciple, so I think that's solid, because Defiance is bigger the longer you wait, because you can Escalate it. So I'll wait on that. We've got a Mutavault. I did not know Mutavault was on Arena. Very powerful card. Just one mana turn into a 2-2, get beaten down with that land. Okay. Start shuffling in some Lightning Bolts. And we have hit enough lands to just cycle the Sokenzen and get a couple 1-1s. Well, just channel the Sokenzen. Town Razor Tyrant. All right, we got no lands for that. This is four to a creature and three to the face, right? Yep. Perfect. They're down to five. We have eight lightning bolts in our deck to draw into. There's a Siege Gang Commander, there goes the Disciple Attacks, and that is a bad time. Well, <laughs> well, 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 that changes things a little. I can still attack with Disciple here and clear out some of their ability to burn things off, and also put more Lightning Bolts in my deck, so I will do that. Because I drew into my own Siege Gang. If I hadn't drawn into my own Siege Gang, I don't think I would have done this. But this clears out three two damage burn spells for them, or it clears out the Siege Gang Commander. Whoa! That's mega bold. Well, unless they kill me, their only option now is to um, clear out basically all of this, because they have to shoot Siege Gang Commander, so I can't shoot them for two. Um, but then they also need to make sure that they have two more creatures than I do, or else I just attack with everybody and kill them. So yeah, the main thing, just kill the main Siege Gang Commander and they'll be okay. But from then, they need to have two more creatures than me. They only have one more, and there's a Lightning Bolt. Oh, they just immediate insta-scoop. They didn't even have to see it. They are like, nah, you have 12 Lightning Bolts in your deck. I'm not sticking around. All right. Well, so far, so good. We remain undefeated for the return to the arena cube draft we are five and oh and now we're guaranteed to be getting the full four thousand gold back out of the event that is the entry fee if you pay with gold so we are at the break even point we're actually at the in the money point because we get the rares and the uncommon and we get all our gold back so sweet sweet stuff out of this draft no matter what happens but we're going to stay in the competition here see if we can get our first seven win run and here we are now for game six against another Lutri deck. This one is on black. So it could be blue black, could be red black. You will see. Black green. Could be like a full five color kind of deck here. 
it's worth it to get aggressive and play the haster, even though we miss out on some potential kicker value later. Threaten some immediate damage. Alright, Lonely End. Very flexible alchemy card. They are on blue, black, and green at minimum. Dark Slick Shores here. Let's drop a Fable turn three. It's a Rona. It doesn't do anything crazy until it flips. And then I'll probably have to reread it because that was a lot of text. Whenever a source deals damage to Rona, the source's controller exiles a card at random from their hand. Okay, so Rona's untouchable, basically. We cannot block Rona, can't attack into Rona. So we need to kill that before it flips. So next turn, I need to hit a land and then Devils play it. Basically. Actually, don't have to hit a land. Well, now I do. I say I don't have to hit a land because I could attack in with my, um, my goblin and get a treasure. Okay, I don't have a land, so now I do really need to hit one to get Rona out of here before anything crazy happens. So we discard what? And probably, because I'm going to hit lands anyway, Plarg. And Electrostatic Blast is looking pretty weak against their current board. Yeah, discard the cheap cards looking for lands to cast the expensive cards. That is bad. That is not what we wanted at all. So, we cast a Magda. I think that's where we're at. We cast a Magda so we can try to attack with her and get treasure tokens. And then now we're on Burn Down the House. Alright, here's the Rona flip. They do attack in. Which means I do get to attack if I clear out the hostage taker. I could Devil's Play Hostage Taker and just send in. Don't have to burn down the house immediately. Could wait and see if they commit any more to the board, either by playing more creatures of their own or spending removal on our creatures. Either way is good for us. Because then the burn down the house becomes more one-sided. And no matter what, when we cast it, they get one of our spells at random that they can cast for themselves, which is super bad, but is what it is. Cannot do anything about that, because we did not hit the land early enough to kill Rona before flip. Alright, so they do spend a removal spell. Spend a removal spell and cast a creature. Beautiful, exactly what we wanted to see. Let's get one last treasure out of Magda first, but then we have to burn down the house and hope that they get something weak, but our hand doesn't really have any weak cards. Sorry, Kaiba. Um, yeah, this is... this Rota is just... The ability is just really, really good against red, because all that red can do is deal damage. Other colors, you might be able to destroy this or exile this, but... Yeah, we would have had to just kill this thing before it flips if we wanted to get around that. So it's going to get its immense value here. Let's see what they get. What did they get? Krenko? That's pretty bad. Because they cast it right now, so they get to attack with it next turn, and they get... A two, three, and two, one ones. There's a Thrag Tusk. Yeah. I think we just got Ronid. Eight 
eight life. If I cast Terror of the Peaks, I have to chump Thrag Tusk and still take like five damage. I'm not seeing any outs here. I was thinking maybe Terror of the Peaks into playing enough creatures we could shoot their blockers away. Well, shoot their attackers away with Terror of the Peaks' damage, but I'm not going to survive long enough to do that anyway. Because I just have to chump block this turn, so I guess I might as well make one of their lands burn them and chump block. But yeah. Got Rona at hard. I think there was a lot we could have done here. I think I played it out pretty much how I should have generally. We should have been digging for those lands to try to kill Rona as quickly as possible before it flipped, because if it flipped, it was going to be a death sentence. We just didn't find the lands quickly enough, and it did flip. So we died. The game would have gone much differently if we killed Rona the turn before it flipped, because then we'd probably still have burned down the house, because we would have just Devil's Played Arona for three before it flipped. And then we would have had the burn on the house at the ready for Thrag Tusk nonsense later. They wouldn't have the any of these goblins or the Krenko, obviously. So, yeah, I think that was the main issue. I don't know what we could have done to mitigate that. Could just, like, weaken the Rona or anything like that. Get ourselves in a better position. Alright, we're at one. We're super dead. Five and one. It will be our first loss of the draft. Here we are now for game number seven. Our opponent's on the play. I am loving this hand. They're going to start with Inspiring Vantage. And they have their own companion. It's Lurus of the Dream Den, which is a terrifying one. But we've got the removal to kill Lurus before it does anything. Lurus allows them to recast any permanents with mana value 2 or less from their graveyard. Also forces them to have only permanents with mana value 2 or less in their deck. So a very low curve deck from our opponent for sure. There is the Selfless Spirit. They can sack this in response to my Molten Impact or my Searing Blood. So they get around both of those, so we Lightning Strike it. And then send in the Courier. There's a Mind Stone. Invasion of Gobacon. Super annoying. These kind of taxing spells out of white. Because they also just get to know what our whole hand is, so they know exactly how much burn we'll have to deal with Lurus. And there are other threats and all that stuff. We do have a Beaumont Courier on board, so we can refuel with a new hand that they won't know about soon enough. And also, I don't think I care too much about what they tax here. I guess Magna would be a little sad. But all these burn spells, like, their board's empty, so if they tax a burn spell, like, we're good. They're going to tax Plarg. Interesting. It's pretty chill with me. They need six. They need a lot of mana to play Lurus and reanimate Selfless Spirit immediately. They would need eight mana right now. So they're going to have to find a time. Three random cards are these two. I'd rather have these two. They're going to have to find a time to put Lurus in their hand while they're not under pressure, which could be right now if they've got the land. They do. Unfortunate. Yep, so now they've got the five mana to play Lurus, bring the Spirit back. And we can't stop that. I think they get priority as soon as Lurus resolves. I believe that's how it works. I guess we'll find out. I'll go in full control mode and try to do it. But no matter what, we have to Searing Blood Lurus or the Selfless Spirit. So I need two mana up, but that's all I need. But all right, we'll go hold full control mode. And we'll see if we get an opportunity to burn Lurus before they activate it the first time, but I don't think we do. Which is pretty gross. Interesting. 
Well, I guess we don't need to figure that out then. They just don't even play Lyris. Just gonna unholy heat the Magda. Sure. Drop a fable. Crack a mind stone, draw a card. Alright. Back into full control mode. Collective Defiance. They're going to make me discard my hand and draw a fresh one. Then we drop Loot Tree. Get a fresh two. I guess they're trying to get they're trying to get the Lurus combo on board without us having an instant up in response. God, full control, why do you make me do hybrid cards too? So goofy. Jam this out so I can still shoot at them here, I think. But maybe it's better to keep that so I'd have another opportunity to get instant speed burn. But I do have Fable to do that as well. Sure. We'll just go for the full the full value fable. They don't have any removal in their grave. I actually might keep Krenko. No, I'm gonna keep Town Razor, because if I hit Stone Nothing, I think it's better to play Town Razor here. I'm gonna hit Stone Nothing. Well, Lurus with the Indestructible Spirit combo could get us here. So we could have drawn one more card to try to find instant speed removal to stop Lurus Cathar. All right. Part of what's really annoying about those white taxing spells, as I said, they knew exactly what my hand was, so they knew they couldn't try to do the Lurus thing, and then they knew they could make me discard my hand to draw a new one. Like, the added extra value of just having my whole hand revealed actually played out really, really poorly for us this game. It's pretty devastating, because now they just have the infinite Lurus combo, where we can't clear it out. Because they will always have the Lurus and the Spirit together. If I ever hit two removal spells, I can still do it, but... There's Collective Defiance, which is actually not the greatest here. I guess, actually it is fine, I was going to say, because I can kill the Spirit with it, but then they stop the damage that goes to their face. But no, if I shoot Lurus, they still take the three, and then they have to take four in the sky. Yeah, this still plays super fine. And Reflection Town Razor Tyrant's insane, right? It is, okay. So we will go... Collective Defiance. I guess because I have Legion War Boss, though. I should maybe not escalate the Collective Defiance. Now, I want to shoot them for another three. This is probably greedy, but I'm going to escalate it. I'm going to maximum escalate it, because they've got a lifelinking blocker as well. All right. So they sack the selfless spirit so the town raiser tyrant gets to get in. So they take 7 and go to 5. They've got a lifelinking Lurus on board. But they'd have to attack to gain that life. And they have to just replay a selfless spirit with Lurus. To make sure that Lurus is still around as well as they have a chump blocker. And then we just try to reflection a Kiki-Jiki. The Town Razor Tyrant for more damage. Alright, there's the Selfless Spirit. They do send in Lurus. I'll offer the trade here. Even trading with the Selfless Spirit is pretty good for me, because then Town Razor Tyrant gets in, so if they don't have removal, they're dead. 
Because that's 8 damage in the sky. Fight with fire, the reflection of Kiki Jiki. So they do have removal, and we hit a land. Not good. Drop Plarg, hit for 4. Drop a land. There's the Selfless Spirit with Luris. Happens when they flip Invasion. Plus one, plus one counter, Hexproof, Indestructible on everybody. Okay. Plus, that's their second spell, so they get another blocker with Clarion Spirit. I have to trade into the Selfless Spirit again. I have to just draw, like, a three damage burn spell here. Yikes. Because, again, if that flips, it counts as their next spell. Clarion Spirit triggers, they get another 1-1 one -one flyer, then they can give the whole board indestructible and hexproof as well on blocks. All right. Well, I think that was the game ending flood there. We just needed to hit a burn spell at that point. And I guess I could still hold Town Razor Tyrant back and just block Luris here. Yeah, that was probably wrong. Should have just held on blocks here. In which case, we're still in a really bad position, because then they just don't attack. They just set up Selfless Spirit plus a 1-1 Flyer plus Maze Mind Tome and start winning with those. Uh, but at least they'd still be at 3. Electrostatic Blast wouldn't even kill them anyway. Plus, if I try to use it, they give the whole board Hexproof Indestructible. Alright, we flooded a bit too hard. Dang. Ended up so close, too. Even after they got the guaranteed Lurus Spirit combo. I mean, there's no there's no outs now. They're getting four a turn. There's no good place to use this Electrostatic Blast when they can sack Spirit in response or Light Shield Array. And the only good creature to even try to kill with it is the Selfless Spirit, in which case they just sack it and this fizzles anyway. Eight life linking power here. All right, unfortunate game there. We are now five and two as we head into round number eight. Here we are for game number eight. Might be the mono red mirror, but we're on the draw, so that would be a bad start if it is. They are red green. All right, Magda Brazen Outlaw is their first play. I will bolt that to stop them from getting any treasures and. Just curving out even more egregiously against us. They're already going to be playing bigger spells than us on curve because they are on the play, but if they're on the play plus get a treasure every turn, it's going to get real bad for us. And the same goes for them having a mana dork like Lana War Visionary. They play a six drop next turn if I don't just burn this out. Plus, this probably isn't big enough to burn most of what they ramp into anyway. Although now I have to. I have really strong cards that it's competing with here. Krenko, Fable, and Disciple all would be really strong plays. But we're letting them play... Not a 6-drop, a 5-drop next turn if I let it stay. This is hopefully big enough to kill most of their 5-drops. 4 damage. Let's go Fable, hold up Defiance. And hopefully Defiance is big enough to kill their 5-drop creature. So they just tap out, play a big dork. We defiance that. Okay, well, it's going to be big enough, but that also just kills my shaman the second it attacks anyway. Because Glorybringer is an incredible card. All right. Our own Magda is looking pretty slow here. We ditch that. Cranko also looking real slow. Go for Terror of the Peaks into some nonsense. Ooh, burn down the house. Hold up a minute. Let's get a loot tree into the hand then. There's a Rampaging Raptor. It's going to be a pretty good burn down the house. I mean, I will lose our Fable, but... 
I think it's worth it. Kill a 4-4 Trample Haste and a Glorybringer here. Our other options are not great at 10 life here. One man away from Collected Finds being a double removal spell, and that'd be really good. Thrag Tusk. Thrag Tusk has been an annoying, annoying card. It's just very good against Mono Red. They gain five, and if we kill it, they still have another blocker out of it. Yeah, that's a pretty big yikes. What do I even do about it? I guess I just get two for one. I just accept that into my life. We just trade Disciple into it. And then be ready to clear out the uh, the beast token. Don't like that they just take that. Very much don't like that. Now I'm gonna have to just like Lutri and Chump, well Lutri and trade on blocks. At five life here, there's too much that can go wrong against green red burn spells and pump spells. Bunch of X mana ones. They have instant speed removal for Lutri and a big enough buff to just kill us at the same time. They've got the instant speed removal for Lutri. Do they have the big enough buff as well or the big enough burn? No, we do survive. We need to start hoping Terror of the Peaks gets us somewhere. We chump with Disciple, ideally. Just all removal. There goes the Terror. That's very funny. All right, well, we're dead. If I Collective Defiance the Terror of the Peaks, it shoots me for three and I die to the Beast. If I Collective Defiance the Beast, I take five from the Terror of the Peaks and die. I guess I can Defiance the Terror and try to chump the, uh, the Beast, but I can't block it with enough power to survive. Is there anything in here? I could Obliterating Bolt from Grave off of Adversary. Then I'm at 2 life. If they clear out Adversary, I die. But if they don't, I trade Adversary into Beast. I think that's my best bet. So I'm not literally dead, but I'm basically dead. So, we never really stood a chance this game. This one was kind of just an aggro mirror match, but we were on the draw instead of on the play, and they had Thrag Tusk, which is just really destructive against Mono Red. And Hunt Master is also incredible against Mono Red. Multiple creatures, and they gain life off of it. Got the War Boss. The trade into the 2 2, and I've got the Defiance to clear out the Hunt Master. Find a Lightning Bolt for later. I mean, if they flood out, the game isn't technically completely over. If that's a land in hand and they draw a land, then we're both playing off the top now. I'm just at a 19 life point disadvantage, which isn't unwinnable. It is still possible to just get luckier draws. But if this is a spell or that's a spell, we're probably dead. All right, one of them was a spell and we are dead. That game actually shaped up slightly closer than I thought. The middle of the game was incredibly lopsided, but as I said before, if that Kogla was a land instead, then 
it ends up with a completely clear board. They have nothing in hand and I have a lightning bolt and we're both playing off the top. So I've got the lightning bolt as like a maybe I don't die immediately button. And if I just get a solid amount luckier, then we were still maybe in that game. But I think we did what we could in pretty much all of our losses today. I think they were just always going to happen. Flooded out a bit for our second loss and our first and our third loss. I think we're just pretty rough matchups. Actually, our first loss was when they flipped the Rona. If we hit a land earlier, I think we could have won that game, but that was going to be a rough matchup because it was also a Thrag Dusk matchup. But overall, don't feel super bad about our losses today. I don't think there's a lot we could have done. Still played it out. Still tried to see if we could hit something. Didn't quite get there. Definitely were alternate lines we could have taken that maybe in hindsight give us another turn or something. But... I don't think anything we did was egregiously bad. No, like, mega punts today or something. So, 5-3, and three, still a super respectable, super reasonable record. It is just always brutal to go 5-0 into 5-3. Sucks to go from a win streak into a loss streak, but that's just the up and down of things. That's just how things swing around, especially in a game with variants like Magic the Gathering. So, 5-0 into 5-3, rough way to end it but a very solid record overall. Not a bad way to start off the return trip to the Arena Cube Drafts. So we'll grab our prizes. We get a Master Symmetrist, an Ancient Brass Dragon, and the Bears of Lit Yara. Some solid prizes, but that is going to end today's video. As always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you're interested in seeing some more videos like this, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. If you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link or the join button below. And other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.